Thank you very much, Helen, for inviting. Uh, obviously, I give all the compliments she made to me. I give the, I return them to her because her work is also very much guiding, and you will see that how nicely it uh, complements. And she also, you, the, uh, the ones of you who heard my talk yesterday, I have a philosophical background, so I always also think about the more basic theoretical question. And Helen pointed that out when you discuss about dep depression. You always at the interface, what is a psychiatric disorder? How can we conceive depression? And I do think that there is indeed sort of a paradigm shift. Now let me guess with the, um, yeah. Um, so how do we have to view psychiatric disorders? Uh, you probably know this movie. And you also know that our brain is nothing but, as the German philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer described it, nothing but gruesome gray, just gray pulp just a gray pulpy mass. So how can we conceive psychiatric disorder? So before I go into some uh, studies showing how to uh, link the clinical symptoms, the patient's experience, and you see as a clinician with uh, modern multimodal imaging methodology, I just want to give you a little bit of view how one might view depression or how one might not view it. So. Um, in the last 10 years of imaging, uh, and you know that imaging is a very young uh, kid, it's still making its first steps, um, that we really said, okay, there are particular regions and we linked uh, specific symptoms with specific regions. That has been sort of widened in the last years sort of to a more network-based approach. Uh, maybe particular symptoms are related to particular network, and there has been a lot of research into that. Um, so that means, for instance, one of the earlier findings, actually from Helen, who showed in earlier PET studies, that in the subgenual cingulate cortex, and you see this is somehow indicated in this um, slide here, the subgenual, pregenual anterior cingulate cortex, there's a resting state hypermetabolism in earlier FTG studies, and um, I don't need to tell you that that uh, is a very robust finding that provided also uh, the starting point for a fascinating deep brain stimulation experiments, which she will talk later about. So can we conceptualize and conceive depression just as a disorder of the uh, perigenial anterior cingulate cortex? That, is not, uh, that does not hold the empirical data because you basically see dysfunction in depression in almost throughout the regions. Even in visual cortex, you see dysfunction. You see altered activity. And that goes along with you see dysfunction in basically almost all neuropsychological functions, cognitive, affective, the various cognitive states. You do not see as pronounced deficits in neuropsychological functions as in lesion-based uh, neurological patients, but you see some subtle changes. Um, and oh. So that sort of uh, leads probably Helen herself and ourselves sort of in parallel really to maybe there's sort of a more, we have to take a more systemic, as I would say, a more systemic or process-based approach. Uh, compare uh, psychiatric uh, depression to medical disorders like diabetes and arthritis. You have diabetes, the insulin affects the whole body. It works everywhere. Arthritis, it can affect every joint and other functions uh, of the body, like immunological disorders are typical systemic disorders. And I would argue, and that is the point I will try to make, that depression is indeed uh, a systemic disorder, if you want to say so, a neurosystemic disorder. But ultimately, when you see the symptoms, it affects the whole body. So that way of thinking, I think, is well sort of indicated <coughs> uh, by this paper, uh, which Helen Meiber co-authored, stuck in a rat. So, so basically, that many of the symptoms we see in depression are compensatory uh, strategies. Uh, they can also be somehow considered achievements to re-stabilize the brain's functions. So, <clears throat> as I already said, I view depression as a systems disorder, like, for instance, diabetes, that affects all parts of the brain as, uh, and all functions of the brain. 
and with symptoms that may arise from compensatory uh, strategies of sort of rebalancing the soul. And now, of course, you will ask, yeah, this is all nice, uh, Mr. Philosopher, but far from reality. Uh, so provide a little bit more meat to the bone. And that's what I want to do. <clears throat> and one of the main features and most robust findings, I already indicated that in depression, is really the abnormal resting state activity. So when the brain is supposedly at rest, it's intrinsic activity. That has been well documented in the hyperactivity in the perigenal anterior cingulate cortex, in the FDG PET, the metabolism by Helen in earlier studies, and has been uh, uh, confirmed since in both human as well as animal, uh, animal studies. So, and obviously there are also other regions which show uh, a lower resting state activity. I will come back to that later. So, <clears throat> and if that is so, if the resting state activity is disbalanced in the brain, that means that any kind of task or stimulus related activity cannot be but being affected by that. And that, I think, accounts for many of the clinical symptoms we see in depression. And I want to make that point now in a series of studies. So let me start with, um, so this is obviously, you already suspected that, that I would answer yes. Um, and now I want to show this in three domains. So basically, now I want to show how the resting state activity, the changes, uh, permeate and confound the uh, activity of different functional systems, if you want to say so, if you want to use the term by the Russian psychologist uh, Luria. Um, so it is obviously in emotions. Emotions is a very heterogeneous construct. It involves emotion perception. It involves emotion judgment anhedonia, so emotional reappraisal, so it has different components, and I will show you a little bit of that and how that is related also to the clinical symptoms. Then, uh, Helen already indicated that uh, the, uh, my, one of my most beloved uh, topics of research is really the sense of self. So how is it possible that you sit here, and I hope for you that you experience a sense of self? Maybe if this kind of view I present here is very close to your own view, then maybe your sense of self and self-specificity of this talk is very high. If you say, oh, it's all bullshit what he's talking about, <laughs> uh, then you might say, okay, your sense of self is not high, you rather get aversive and say, I don't want to deal with that. But still, there's always sort of a sense of self, and that you will see is in depression highly altered. And then one of the major symptoms, and you all know this as clinicians, is the physical symptoms. Um, I remember I had seen several uh, depressed patients who, after sort of an, a long time, six to eight months, went through the different internal medical departments, uh, through the different medicine departments, and nothing could be found. And the last station was then finally psychiatry and turned out to be depression. So I will present you in the following some studies, so how you see how the research aligns itself and starts the clinical as a starting point, and then on the other hand, sort of gets some ideas also for possible future treatment. So let me start with the most obvious, the emotion. As I said, there are different components uh, in, uh, in emotions, uh, and f uh, one major distinction is the uh, uh, differentiation between perception and judgment. So uh, I don't want to go into detail about this. Uh, so we presented some emotional pictures where they just had to view the picture. And then they also had to judge the picture. And as you can already see, the judgment uh, requires different cognitive abilities, like working memory, uh, attention, um, goal direction, and motor planning and everything, which is not involved in perception. So what we did sort of, uh, we wanted sort of to really see how is all that related to the seemingly abnormal resting state activity. So what you can do is you present, you uh, compare your task or stimulus related activity, in this case the emotional perception, versus uh, a baseline sort of a resting state 
which we call here baseline. And we did that first in healthy subjects. And what you could see here, so we compared all the resting state activity larger than emotional perception. And for somebody who's experienced in imaging, what you get is no surprise. You see a lot of cortical midline regions. So, and throughout my talk, you will hear a lot about cortical midline structures as we coined them. Um, so here you see the ventral medial prefrontal cortex and you see the posterior cingulate cortex slash precuneus. And this is very typical when you compare, these are the regions which show higher activity during the baseline. And most important is that we also ask the subjects afterwards, outside the scanner, to evaluate the degree of the positivity or negativity of the emotions, here coined by the term valence. Um, and whether their experience is positive and negative. And what was interesting that we could find a relationship between the degree of signal changes and the degree of emotional valence. And this was just in healthy subjects. So the more activity in the ventral medial prefrontal cortex, the more negative the emotional perception. So meaning the higher the activity there, the more negative you perceive that emotional picture. And that obviously provides a very nice starting point for a hypothesis in depressant subjects. So we did exactly the same study in uh, healthy subjects and depressed subjects. And what you could see is, again, you see, so this is a comparison healthy larger than depressed. And you could clearly see that, again, similar regions in the midline regions, very close to your subgenual cingulate cortex, Helen Myberg's uh, 25 closely to uh, CG25. She will explain more on that. And you see the posterior region. So you really see, again, the cortical midline structures. And if you now would expect increased resting state activity, you would expect that the perception induces less or lower activity changes in depression than in healthy subjects. Because if you start from a higher point, then of course, in an absolute sense, you can induce less changes. And this is shown in these slides. You see here the healthy subjects. These are the different con uh, conditions, emotional perception, emotional judgment, with and without anticipation, and so on. And you see a clear, what we call, deactivation on negative signal changes. Because in these regions, there's high resting state activity, so the stimulus or the task can only induce a lowering of the activity changes. And you can see that is rather diminished in depressed patients. And that is due, certainly most likely due, to the abnormally high resting state activity. So this is basically a nice confirmation of what Helen found in earlier uh, PET studies um, that there seems to be increased resting state activity in these regions. And I skipped that. And now, of course, you want to say, yes, this is all nice. But is this really relevant? Is this relevant clinically, as well as relevant for how the patient subjectively experience the emotions? So that's, what, so that's why we then correlated uh, the activity in these regions with the subjective ratings of the emotional valence, in particular the negative emotions, of course, because they are so central in depression. So you can see here, this is the degree of valence, particularly the negative emotions, how negatively they experience them, and here's the degree of signal changes. You see a clear relationship, which is significant in the healthy subjects, yeah? whereas meaning, <coughs> whereas, in depressed subjects, you don't see such a significant relationship. It no longer correlates. And that really pertains to the title of Helen's paper, Stuck in a Red. Because the resting state activity is so high that it cannot modulate different degrees of less or more negative emotions. So basically, even if they want, if they see something which is less negative to them, they cannot properly downmodulate their activity anymore. So that means they're really stuck in the negativity and they cannot get out of it. And this is a pattern we find often. So basically, 
the neuronal activity is so high that it's no longer reactive to subtle changes and hence which are manifest in our experience in an experience of different shadings of different degrees of emotional experience. This is a correlation pattern we saw in many of our studies that we had a significant relationship in healthy subjects but in depression there was no modulation anymore. So basically the neuronal activity is no longer reactive and I think that matches nicely with what you see in the clinical patients. So basically they're completely stuck in their negative emotions. There is no way out of them because apparently their brain is no longer reactive. So basically what you find is here in healthy subjects the cortical midline regions can properly deactivate because the resting state activity seems to be in an optimal level where they can fluctuate to the highest degree possible which in turn allows to subjectively experience different shadings, different degrees of negative or positive emotions. And you can see here in depressed subject that is highly reduced. And hence they are really stuck, not stuck in a rut, but stuck in the negative emotions. And that's exactly what you see in, uh, in the clinical presentation. So <clears throat> um, now I shift a little bit within the emotion from emotion perception to emotion judgment. Studies in healthy subjects have shown that there's a direct relationship between the medial and the lateral prefrontal cortex. If the medial prefrontal cortex deactivates, like here, the lateral activates. So it's sort of a reciprocal pattern between medial deactivation and lateral activation. So this is a pattern which has been shown and well established in healthy subjects. So purely from that you now might assume, yeah, uh, then if the depressed patients cannot properly downmodulate here, they probably cannot properly upmodulate and activate their lateral prefrontal cortex. And as you, I'm sure you all know that the lateral prefrontal cortex has something to do with cognitive functions, evaluation, judgment. We tested for that now with comparing emotional judgment versus emotional perception. So now what we compare is sort of all those activity changes larger during emotional judgment when compared to emotional perception. Obviously in healthy subjects, no surprise, you see the left dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, left DLPFC indicated here. No surprise that was to be expected. And <clears throat> but what is in, uh, and you see that the healthy subjects are larger than the depressed subjects in the left DLPFC. Again, no surprise because the left dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex hypofunction is again one of the most consistent findings in depression and you know that that is also the target region for transcranial magnetic stimulation. And we then plotted the signal changes for these regions during perception and judgment. And that's where it becomes really interesting. Because in perception, here the gray bar are the, healthy, uh, are the depressed uh, subjects, the uh, darker bars are the healthy subjects. And you see that in perception there's no difference between healthy and depressed. But it's only during the judgment when they have to recruit their cognitive functions. So that is really, and this is an interesting thing, so there seems to be a certain neuropsychological specificity to the recruitment, to the hypofunction of the DLPFC in depression. And <clears throat> you know that they have a lot, and that may be specifically related to the cognitive inabilities. So <clears throat> what about if there's left, there's also right. I'm sure everybody of you knows. So there's also a right dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. And when you look at the studies um, in transcranial magnetic stimulation, you apply high and low frequency, one in 10 hertz frequency stimulation uh, in different ways. Uh, you, one you apply to the right DLPFC, the other to the low DLPFC. So it seems to be that there's a hypo, hyperfunction in the right dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. And that's exactly what we could find here. Uh, and again, specifically during the judgment. So there seems to be not only a disbalance 
between medial and left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, but that goes along with the disbalance between right and left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. And maybe that these different disbalances may already be somehow predisposed by an abnormal resting state activity pattern. So this is where you see the depressed patients apparently cannot avoid but reacting in this way because of the abnormal resting state activity pattern with hypofunction in the left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, hyperactivity in the mid midline frontal regions, which is indeed has been confirmed such an abnormal resting state activity pattern. Um, so there may be just sort of, you see there's an abnormal balance in the midline regions. You show apparently increased resting state activity and that leads during task or stimulus related activity to decreases in activity. So the patients do not react anymore and properly to s emotional stimuli or they are not affected anymore by, for instance, less negative or positive stimuli. And that is exactly what you see in the clinical presentation. At the same time, there seems to be a disbalance with the uh, left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, which may be related uh, to the cognitions and the particular negative cognitions. And that pattern of abnormal hyperactivity in the midline regions and abnormal uh, hypoactivity in the lateral, as I said, is already predisposed by a similar resting state activity pattern. So it's really that the resting state, basically the floor on which the depressed patients move is already altered by itself. And obviously every subsequent step is affected by that. So that was about uh, emotions. Let me skip uh, these uh, slides and come to uh, another even more important topic is is the self. So what is the self? Everybody experiences it, but when I ask you for a definition, you probably say, let the philosophers discuss. Um, let me start with the depression. And you can learn a lot from depression for the sense of self. So this is a nice description of depression, depression I think, by, uh, by Trainer et al. Uh, and I think I will read that because it really so nicely describes the abnormal importance and focus of the own self, the depression, uh, depressed patient experience. She said, by the window, looking inward rather than looking out. Her thoughts were consumed with her sadness. She viewed her life as a broken one. And yet, she could not place her finger on the exact moment it fell apart. How did I get to feel this way? She repeatedly asked herself. By asking, she hoped to transcend her depressed state. Through understanding, she hoped to repair it. Instead, her questions led her deeper and deeper inside herself, further away from the path that would lead to her recovery. So what this quote nicely describes is, you have an abnormal focus on the own self, as manifest in the ruminations, and they all circle around your own self. You have a sense of guilt. Oh, I'm guilty. I'm not worth getting treatment. Uh, I'm not worth living. It's all around the own self. So we coined that the increased self-focus. Whereas at the same time, the depressed patient is disconnected from the environment. Uh, so he can't connect with the environment. And what I mean by connecting is sort of an, an, a tacit implicit sense. And especially the relatives often feel that, that's, that the spouse can no longer connect to her and it's very painful. And we coined that the decreased environment focus. So how can we approach that in neurobiological terms? <clears throat> um, so as I said, we said that sort of as an increased self-focus and how can we uh, research that? Um, I will make a brief detour into the domain of the healthy, of the healthy self and then come back to the depressed self. Um, we did uh, the self. It's very popular in neuroscience since about 10, 15 years. It really shifted from philosophy to, uh, and then also now to neuroscience. 
and uh, there have been various studies conducting sort of where people lie in the scanner and had to decide, okay, this word has something to do with myself, this word has nothing to do with me. As for instance, uh, a concert pianist, who of course, when he hears the word grand piano <clears throat> or Beethoven sonata, then of course it has a high personal relevance or high degrees of self-specificity. Whereas a brain, when he sees a brain, maybe for the concert pianist, has no meaning at all, low self-specificity. Okay, so, and we did an early meta-analysis of all these uh, studies, and uh, what we found is really that all those plotted really in the midline regions of the brain, here you see particularly the anterior cortical midline regions, posterior, but throughout. And across the different domains, be it the emotional domain, social domain, or memory domain. So that led sort of to the concept of what we call the cortical midline structures. Uh, you can see the various regions, and you can see that the subgenual cingulate, perigenual cingulate uh, are crucial parts of that. And, and that this sort of seems to be a network which is particularly relevant for processing, for assigning the degree of personal relevance or self-specificity to a stimulus. Obviously, these regions, as you probably all know very well, also are the core part of what is called the default mode network, and so particular high uh, activity in the resting state, high intrinsic activity. And you already saw in the previous slide, particularly this set of regions involved. So for me, it was really uh, a door opener when I saw the same reason involved in self as well as in depression. So. <clears throat> Um, so then we thought, okay, uh, what about the self in depression? So we let subjects now uh, emotional stimuli, and now they uh, had to evaluate the, the degree of personal relevance or how close, how personally relevant these emotions, uh, these pictures are to them. And uh, what we again showed, so this is just uh, now uh, doing the judgment of self-relatedness, and you can again see the comparison between depression and healthy subjects, and interestingly again you see a set of midline regions. And also interesting, you see some subcortical regions. So this is something we often observe in our studies on the self. We observe the cortical midline regions, as here the preconius uh, close to the uh, posterior cingulate, here the dorsomedial prefrontal cortex, often we also see the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, and as I said, often the subcortical regions. Here you see the dorsomedial thalamus, and often we also see the PAG and the tectum, and sometimes even going deeper into the midbrain. And that, of course, is highly relevant for depression because you know that there is where the rough nucleus uh, is located and senses serotonergic afferences to cortical regions. So, <clears throat> um, and you can see again that, again, in these regions, there's a major difference in activity between healthy subjects and depressed subjects. And then we directly correlated the degree of personal relevance subjects assigned to the stimulus with the degree of neural activity induced by the very same stimulus. And you see again, uh, you see a correlation in the healthy, you don't see in subcortical regions, here like the ventral striatum and the dorsomedial thalamus, you don't see a correlation in healthy subjects or a negative correlation, but you see an abnormally positive correlation in the dorsomedial thalamus and the ventral striatum in depressed patients. So that means maybe it is the subcortical regions abnormally driving the neural activity and the degree of self-relatedness in these patients. So maybe it's one possible hypothesis that the subcortical regions hijack the cortex, and that the cortex has no means to defend itself against each other. But of course, that's at this point a tentative hypothesis. So now I showed you so far that the midline regions are involved in stimulus-related activity to the self. What you want is how is that related to resting state activity? Maybe it's that sort of a secondary manifestation 
of the abnormal resting state activity, which is supposed to be abnormally high. And that obviously would make my point with the systemic disorder. So we did this again in an indirect approach that we compared all uh, task-related changes to a baseline. First, what we did also is that, uh, which is no surprise on the purely behavior level, but it's an interesting finding, um, that particularly the, the valence rating, so the healthy subjects, had a direct correlation between positive emotional valences and self-relatedness. So the more positive the item, the higher person, the more personally relevant. Everybody of us knows this is a positive self-reference effect. It's no surprise, has been well shown. But you see in the depressed subject, this is no longer the case. So they no longer modulate. The, uh, there's no direct relationship between positive emotional valences and, uh, um, and uh, no, here it is, uh, and the degree of self-reference. So basically, they're indeed stuck. But they modulate the more negative uh, the emotional ratings, the higher degree of self-relatedness. Whereas in positive emotions, uh, in negative emotions, the healthy subject do not show such relationship. So that means on the behavior level, which is uh, no wonder that's exactly what you see clinically, they associate a degree of self-relatedness or personal relevance exclusively with negative emotions, whereas we, as healthy subjects, associated with positive emotions. That's probably what keeps us going. And some people argue that we might sort of have a self-positive bias and that the depressed patients are more realistic. And for that realism, they suffer from depression. So I leave that for you to decide. Yeah? <laughs> um, and then, as I said, we compared again to the resting state and what you can see again uh, in exactly the same way, you can again see sort of the decrease in deactivation, in particular the corti anterior cortical midline regions you see here, perigenual anterior cingulate dorsomedial prefrontal cortex. You see the gray bars as a depressed subject, and you see severe uh, lack in the ventromedial prefrontal cortex. They simply cannot proper deactivate because they cannot modulate the abnormally high resting state activity anymore. It seems to be simply too high. Yeah? They cannot, if the floor is too high in the, in the room, you cannot put any furniture anymore because there's simply no space left. And that's probably the scenario which uh, seemed maybe the case in depression. Uh, and again, we correlated here the degree of self-relatedness with the degree of signal changes, and you see again here in depression, a nice, in healthy subject, a nice correlation. And here in depression, you don't see. So you see a lack of parametric modulation of neural activity by the different degrees of self-relatedness. And indeed, as I said, they're really stuck. They're stuck in a red, as Helen pointed out so nicely in her paper. They're really stuck in the high resting state activity, and there's no escape. It actually seems if the resting state activity is too low, it's not good either. Then you may also be stuck and prone to some kind of strange changes. That's probably the case in schizophrenia or even in vegetative state when you lose consciousness. So <clears throat> I showed you so far um, a focus on the midline regions, a focus on emotions and self. Uh, and I didn't really specify what I mean by self. The self obviously has different components, and one central component of our self is the body. But the body uh, also has to be made to your own self. You have to accommodate and appropriate the body, which is always coming with your brain, to that it is your body. And you experience, as you want to say it, a certain degree of minusness, or this is specifically my body, you feel a uh, sense of association. So the question is, how does that come about? And in depressed subjects, you obviously see um, 
you see strong physical symptoms. So there's an abnormal awareness of the body. There's an abnormal awareness of the own self, as I described it as increased self-focus. There's a decreased awareness of the environment, a decreased environment focus. And there's also a de increased focus on the own body. Uh, many patients experience abnormal physical symptoms. They experience their heart racing when it's actually not racing, heartbeat pounding, and all those kinds of things. So that uh, <coughs> so raises the questions, what are the physical symptoms? And that brings you to one region there will be, uh, about which there will be a very interesting symposium tomorrow morning, to the insula. The insula has very close connections to the perigenual anterior cingulate cortex, to the anterior midline regions, and also to the suprageneal anterior cingulate cortex. And, and it has also close uh, linkage to the ventral striatum and the chordate. So this is documented in that the insula has been found to be associated with reward. And here the insula has been closely associated with emotion, and there also have been studies uh, other groups, as well as our groups, showed that the insula is also related, excuse me, to self-specificity. And what makes the insula so peculiar? So it's part of the limbic system that will be discussed tomorrow in detail. And most interesting that it receives strong interoceptive input from the own body, as well as also extraceptive input. So it really seems to be uh, what Dr. Black said yesterday, a hub, a nodal point for inter-extraceptive uh, stimuli where they come together and are matched with each other and integrated. So that's probably what makes the insula so central. So how can we test that? So we, uh, relying on a paradigm by Critchley, uh, Critchley, we tested for interceptive awareness by letting subjects count their heartbeat. Um, maybe at first glance you say, I don't hear my heart pounding, so how can I count my heartbeat? But uh, when you train subjects, they can do it uh, very good. So it's, it's amazing. And at the same time, while they hear their heartbeat, they always hear a tone, an auditory presented tone, obviously. Uh, and either they have to aware, shift their awareness to the heartbeat or to the tone. So it's really sort of a shifting of your awareness towards different contents, either the content of your own body, your heart, or the content presented in the external environment, the tone. So this is a very nice paradigm sort of to test and also for the abnormal self-body, uh, self-environment relation in the depressed subjects. And we also included a longer baseline. Um, so this is again sort of the paradigm. Subjects had to perceive their heartbeat for nine to 13 seconds, either perceive the heartbeat as indicated by the heart, so this means the heart, it's no laugh, um, and this is the tone, and then they had to make the judgment how many uh, beats of the heartbeat or how many times the tone were played, and then followed by a longer baseline. Um, and no surprise, when you compare intro versus uh, extraception, you find stronger activity in the bilateral insula. I here presented the right insula, and you can see um, <clears throat> the red is the um, um, are the uh, healthy subjects. Let me see. The red is the interception, and the blue is the extraception. And we then also correlated, and this is the interesting thing. We correlated that with subjective measures of awareness, like the body perception scale questionnaire. It's a BPQ. And that's an instrument which mainly measures stress, subjective stress response. So how do I feel stress? And stress is obviously very closely related to the body. Um, and you would expect that stress is directly related to the interceptive processing. This is what we tested for here. Excuse me, the yellow comes out uh, very bad. Here for the inter, so we linked, we correlated the uh, subjective stress measures from this questionnaire with the signal changes during interoception. During interoception, no correlation. Then we correlated that with the extraceptive signal changes, the blue, no correlation. The only correlation we got was when we directly 
computed the difference between intero and extero receptive signals against the body perception questionnaire. So that really means when you experience subjectively experience stress, it's really the relation of the intro and exoceptive stimuli. And that, of course, yields a lot of thoughts for the depressed patients. So I show you the, left, the same for the left insula, and you again see the same pattern, particularly the difference between intro and exoceptive signals correlates. So these are healthy subjects. So what happens now in depressed subjects? So what we see in depressed subjects is um, <clears throat> You can see that, surprisingly, in the interception, there's no difference. So this is the interceptive awareness. When they perceive their own heartbeat, the blue ones are the depressed. The, rest, the red ones are the healthy subject. There's no difference here. But there's a difference in the processing of the extraceptive stimuli. So it's not that the depressed subjects uh, exper experience them uh, process them in an abnormal way. So the main difference is not in the interceptive processing, but apparently in the exoceptive processing, and that means that the difference between intro exoceptive processing becomes also abnormal. So, and the same pattern we observe also in the right insula. And you can see in depressed subjects here you can see the correlation with the subjective stress instruments uh, for the right insula. You remember we had a correlation, particularly with the interoxoceptive difference. And you can see that here the red ones are the healthy subjects, the blue ones are the depressed subjects. And you basically see there's no correlation anymore. So the blue line is completely flat. So that means that the signal changes in the insula can no longer be modulated by different degrees of subjective stress. So it's again, it is no longer responsive to fine-grained changes. Its neuronal reactivity, it's considerably decreased. And that in turn leads to the feeling body symptoms and they cannot get out of it. And then of course, because they're really stuck, as Helen said, in a rut or in, their body, in this case, in their bodily symptoms. Their insular activity is no longer reactive. And then, of course, they try to develop all kinds of cognitions to get out of that. And that's exactly what you see. Yeah? And remember the <laughs> quote, what I described uh, at the beginning. So what are the uh, future directions for depression? How can we uh, 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 further enhance it? So I showed you that the resting state activity is relevant, very much relevant in emotions, in self-focus. Self and I leave, left this out. There's also some indication that the resting state is abnormal in insula. So um, what I show you here is sort of the figure. What I completely left out is the genetic component. But I would argue that the resting state, the abnormal pattern of resting state activity might serve as a nice link between the genetic level and the psychopathological level. And what I completely haven't left out and that will come particularly relevant in the last talk is the biochemical modulation. Uh, be besides, obviously, serotonin, GABA and glutamate are a major player in that. And other studies, as well as our own studies, showed that the abnormal resting state activity in the anterior cingulate cortex is particularly related to abnormalities in GABA and glutamate in depression. And then, of course, you might want to go into the future into more molecular domains with the BDNF, cytokines, etc. And ultimately, it comes down, it would be interesting to investigate in the future genes for subunits of GABA A receptors uh, and the d different types of glutamatergic receptors, as well as, obviously, serotonin. And that, in turn, might provide abnormalities here, might provide what I described here as neuronal predisposition for de depression. Um, that also is a point where maybe the question for neurodevelopmental uh, changes comes in.
But that me does not mean that the neural predisposition must necessarily result in uh, clinical symptoms of depression. For that, which I haven't left out here, there may come in addition, we need the right kind of psychosocial context sort of to make these abnormalities, which are sort of dormant and may not be even visible in the patients, become manifest. So that may be like uh, when you compare this to, for instance, diabetes, you might have sort of a deficit, a reduced in, uh, degree of insulin, and that is actually uh, quite long compensated for. So it is not manifest in any kind of symptoms before the actual diabetes breaks out. And that may compare, at least at this stage in time, maybe in 10, 20 years I see things differently. I would argue that maybe that could be compared sort of to, resting, to the abnormal resting state abnormality. It's abnormal spatial pattern. And something I haven't talked about at all is that there may also be abnormal temporal patterns. Um, the resting state is characterized by particular low frequency fluctuations in the very low frequency domains uh, uh, smaller than zero. And that uh, have been some initial studies showed that these are abnormal in, uh, in depression too. So there may be an abnormal spatial and functional organization, uh, spatial and temporal organization of the resting state. And any subsequent stimulus and task is weaved uh, and integrated into this and has to deal with this abnormal spatial temporal organization, which then, of course, also becomes transferred to the task or stimulus related activity. So, <clears throat> and once that happens, of course, the depressed patient has no chance but to become depressed. Um, clinically, um, that means does the resting state may serve as an endophenotype, sort of as a bridge between the genetic and the psychopathological level. This is what I argued with a colleague of mine from Switzerland in this paper, and he made this very nice graphic, which is probably see, uh, difficult to see, uh, hard to see for you, but <clears throat> basically what we argued here is that we argued here for different endophenotype with the resting state, uh, uh, one of them maladaptive responses to the environment being another one, and here you see the biochemical level, GABA and glutamate, based on the current findings. Here you see a molecular level, and then you see the symptomatic level. <clears throat> so <clears throat> I think, and that also spurns probably uh, also uh, some new uh, therapeutic development where we say maybe we need drug which particular target the resting state or the spatial and temporal features of the resting state activity, which that though is obviously uh, music uh, of the future. And this is my last slide, which probably comes to no surprise. So you see, I see the resting state as the center. It's like in diabetes, obviously the pancreas is the very center because it produces the insulin, but which has overall systemic effects. Um, and that the resting state is obviously also a mirror of your, neuro, your previous life experience because there are strong indications that the resting state ingrains prior experiences via what we call stimulus-rest interaction. And <clears throat> um, then obviously there's the animal models, and as I said, there's strong indications from both uh, animal studies as well as uh, human imaging studies that is indeed abnormal resting state activity, so there seems to be a, a strong, uh, robust finding. And obviously, we would like to need to dis uh, distinguish then later also between trait and state marker and the therapy. I uh, turn over to Helen and uh, my the, uh, next two speakers who are much more versatile in that domain than me. Thank you very much. Thank you for that uh, wonderful presentation.
Uh, one of the questions that I have on the uh, resting state phenomena uh, that you're talking about with depression is uh, its applicability to post-traumatic stress and um, negative imaging uh, by service members in that in terms of changing their resting state and their affective uh, ability to engage with others when they come back. Can you comment a little bit about that as it relates to uh, your work with depression? Yeah. Um, as I understand, your question is mainly about PTSD and resting state, how that right. relates to depression. Correct. Yeah. Um, there's certainly uh, resting state abnormalities have been found in uh, PTSD too. I'm, I'm far from being a specialist. As far as I know, they mainly found uh, a lowering of resting state activity and decreased functional connectivity. And I think the finding of abnormally high resting state activity in the perigenual anterior subgenual anterior cingulate cortex is, as, as far as I understand, it's pretty specific for depression. That really um, f uh, decreased uh, functional connectivity and levels of resting state activity have been found in schizophrenia, in Alzheimer's, in autism, but the hyperactivity in that region seems to be a very relatively specific for depression. Um, the question, of course, obviously is um, how is it possible that PTSD is so often going along with depression? That's probably a question to be answered in the future. I'm not aware of studies PTSD with depression versus PTSD without depression and resting state, but maybe there have been one more very recent, I don't know. Um, you talked about the depression as, as a general term. Do you see a difference between major depression and bipolar depression? Yeah. When I was talking here about mainly unipolar depression, um, and all the results were from unipolar depression, and that's where the most robust findings were. The question for bipolar depression is an interesting one. Um, these findings concern mainly unipolar depression. Um, they somehow overlap with bipolar depression, but they're not identical. Yeah? And clinically, um, what I find the most interesting thing in bipolar depression coming from my perspective of the self is that these patients, the bipolar patients often report to always have throughout their life a very unstable sense of self. They didn't really know what kind of mood to associate it with their sense of self. But that's a clinical, very tentative observation. Thank you. Hi, I have a question. Uh, uh, this is very interesting work. I really like the connection to the clinical observations about the internally directed, you know, life of somebody who's depressed. Um, and um, I have a question about the interpretation of your results, um, which is it, it seems like, uh, so especially in um, the task-related data, um, that uh, most or many of the results could be explained by a decreased engagement with the task or a decreased attention to it or a decreased uh, performance of the task or something like that so that, um, in other words, uh, decreased um, or, or smaller deactivations could be like, just like smaller activations could reflect um, simply the person's not doing as much as the person with, uh, they're not doing the task as much as a healthy person might. So I've, uh, since you have a lot of data, I just wondered if you could maybe direct our attention to results that that, that couldn't explain. Uh, that's something we controlled for. We usually put in the, the task-related performances like reaction times as a regressor into the uh, analysis of the imaging data to exclude attention-related task engagement-related factors. Exactly that. Would that... Um, but the groups probably still differed substantially, I imagine, on those measures? Or, yeah, or no? but yeah. if you put them as a regressor, as a covariate into your data analysis of the imaging, then you at least, in part, statistically, uh -huh. control for that. Okay. Yeah. But, Thank you for your attention. But the question is, what is, also, what is chicken and egg? Yeah, um, that's part of the decreased task engagement, maybe a consequence of the de increased resting state activity. So it's, yeah, Dr. the decreased reactivity. Yeah. Dr. Merkhoff, uh, I have a neurophilosophical question for you. If it is abnormal resting state, what it means normal resting state? If it is normal resting means what means normal activity state? 
And if it is state, why you call it disorder? Maybe it is response. And what is really differences between them? And what is biological meaning to have normal and abnormal resting states in the sense of specific data, not just understanding of this? Because idea that depression is kind of abnormal biological response to some kind of situation is probably 110 years. But can it be more specific to state what it means resting nor normal and abnormal in this situation? Yeah, and what is the meaning to have abnormal state? Maybe it is more response than disorder, not diabetes, like inflammation type. Yeah. OK, that's a good point. Uh, first and foremost, here it is used in a purely statistical sense, compared with healthy and uh, uh, depressed subjects, but that doesn't relieve me of an answer to your question. And I think the exact parameters which are relevant to answer to your question, we don't know yet. You may have noticed that sometimes I slip through with the concept of neuronal reactivity. That uh, depressed brain's resting state may no longer be properly reactive to stimulus or task-related activity. And the degree of that neuronal reactivity might serve as an indicator of resting state. But we don't really know this at this point. Uh, another measure, so if the reactivity is that it doesn't react anymore to task or stimulus related activity, that may be an indicator of an abnormal, let's put it in parentheses. The other indicators which may be, you might have heard me at the very end speaking about the spatial and temporal organization of the resting state, which is of course a very metaphorical term. Uh, one of such I indicated a little bit, where you remember with the uh, midline regions and the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, the uh, reciprocal modulation or anti-correlation. If that degree of anti-correlation is sort of resolved and no longer anti-correlates, then you might have an abnormal resting state. And that's exactly what you can observe in functional connectivity investigation. But you're absolutely right. We simply do not understand enough of the resting state itself, nor of its interaction with task or stimulus related activity to answer your question. Let's, let's take one more question and then we'll take a break. Yes, hi. Uh, my question is about the, the connection between your presentation and the, the concepts you discussed and transcranial man magnetic stimulation. I, I you can't hear me? I, I didn't hear that. OK. So the question is about the connection between the, the model of the depression you presented and the use of transcranial magnetic stimulation for depression. So I, I really don't know details about if there are specific targets chosen for transcranial magnetic stimulation, if there are certain parameters, etc. So I wanted to know if you can comment, if you know about that, if, if the model you presented about the medial uh, brain aspects of depression, the influence of subcortical uh, structures, the influence of the, the role of the medial and lateral prefrontal cortex, if any of that is conceptualized or used when thinking of treatment with DMS for depression. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, as, as you know, it is mostly used for the do left dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. And when you see these results, it makes perfect sense that it is used because they have a hypoactivity. How much that really normalize the other networks, like, for instance, the hyperactivity in the pre-subgenual cingulate cortex, I'm not aware of any combined TMS, PET, or imaging studies showing that. But what you would expect if, if it has therapeutic effects uh, that it sort of normalizes these abnormal patterns you see in uh, depression. And, and you know that the therapeutic efficacy is, <clears throat> um, particularly for TMS, is difficult. Um, it's very controversial. But that I'm, I'm not aware of directly measuring studies that. And you would probably, to have more longer lasting effect, you probably need to affect the resting state patterns. And that's probably what you do with ECT. Yeah. yeah.